groups of biological molecules, carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids. These molecules are examples of organic compounds as they contain the element carbon. This table indicates some of the elements that they share. Carbohydrates, these molecules provide energy for living organisms. The basic units of these molecules are simple sugars, which can join together to make complex sugars. Monosaccharides, which is a simple sugar, act as fast sources of energy. Examples include glucose, fructose, and galactose. Disaccharides are formed when two monosaccharides join together. Examples include sucrose, lactose, and maltose. Polysaccharides, which are complex sugars, are molecules important for the slow release and storage of energy. There are three important complex carbohydrates, which are cellulose, starch, and glycogen. Cellulose found in the plant cell wall can't be digested by humans and so acts as fiber to create bulk to help muscles of the intestinal wall push food through the digestive system. Starch. This is how glucose is stored in plants. It can be broken down to release energy for the plant. Glycogen. Excess glucose in animals is stored as this molecule in the liver and can be broken down to release glucose. Our next biological molecule is lipids. These molecules are a store of energy and provide more energy than both carbohydrates and proteins. Lipids are made from two molecules, glycerol and fatty acids. Our final biological molecule are proteins. These molecules are essential for growth and repair. They can be used as a source of energy if lipid and carbohydrate levels are low. Each protein is made from subunits called amino acids. There are 20 different types of amino acids. Some of these amino acids are made from the body, are referred to as non-essential, and some of these are obtained from our food, which are referred to as essential. Enzymes are biological catalysts made from proteins that speed up chemical reactions inside of living organisms. The lock and key theory describes how enzymes work. Each enzyme has an active site where molecules called substrate bind. The enzymes will only bind to one particular substrate, making them specific. Let's go through this step by step. In step one, the substrate will collide with the active site of the enzyme. You will notice here that the active sites have a complementary shape to the substrate. If they are not complementary, they will not bind. The reality is the substrate does not have to perfectly fit into the active site as the enzyme has the ability to change shape to make the substrate to fit better. This is referred to as the induce fit model, where the substrate induces a change in the enzyme that causes it to fit more snugly around the substrate. In step two, enzymes aid the formation of new bonds or break bonds in the substrate. This stage is referred to as the enzyme substrate complex. It shows that the fit between the enzyme and the substrate is like a lock and a key. In step three, the products are released, the enzyme is unchanged and can catalyze more reactions. It's important to note that enzymes can build larger molecules as well as break them down. Enzymes are pH and temperature sensitive. Let's look at how temperature affects enzyme action. As the temperature increases, so does the rate of reaction this is due to more collisions between the enzyme and the substrate as they gain more kinetic energy and are moving around faster. Once the temperature reaches the optimum temperature, which is when the enzyme works at its best, past the optimum temperature, the enzyme begins to denature. Denaturing is a permanent change to the shape of the active site. This change in shape prevents the substrate from binding to the active site of the enzyme. Denaturation occurs when the bonds holding the protein molecules in its shape are broken. This can be due to changes in temperature or pH. Although the primary structure is largely unaffected, they will lose their specific shape. This process is nearly always irreversible. If you look at the graph, you can see that it produces a bell shape. Depending on what enzyme you look at, you will get a different optimum temperature. In this image, you can visually see what is happening to the active site as the temperature passes the optimum temperature. The shape of the enzyme is unchanged up to the optimum temperature. Past the optimum temperature, the enzyme's active sites begin to change, preventing the substrate from binding and so the reaction eventually stops. Looking now at how pH affects enzyme action. Just like before, 
we can see a bell-shaped graph. The shape of the enzyme is unchanged at the optimum pH. If the pH is higher or lower than the optimum pH, the enzyme's active sites begin to change, preventing the substrate from binding and so the reaction eventually stops. Hi, my name is Mr. Science, aka Salim. If you're new to the channel, please remember to like and subscribe. And for more teaching or resources, you can visit my website at www.mrscience.co.uk.